experience, having worked with gamblers, um, is that it's an incredibly powerful addiction. It has, um, well, it's like all addiction, really, you know, that cunning aspect to it and that, but there's something particularly powerful about gambling and about the levels of denial in people that you work with that, that are gamblers. Um, what can I say, really? It's, it's always been very challenging for me to work with, with, with a gambler because, in general, gambling comes with other addictions also. There may well be alcohol, you know, um, as another addiction connected. There may well be drug use also. And that kind of complicates things. And then coupled with that, I think the level of denial and the level of um, psychological kind of strain in relation to a, a gambling addiction, you know, makes mental health issues, they become apparent also. Because there's very, very serious mental health issues with, with gambling. I mean, culminating in suicidal ideation or suicide, depression, anxiety, all these things come into play in a, in a you know, a strong gambling addiction. The levels of denial are, are pretty well unprecedented in gambling. It can be, it can be very difficult because it's that whole kind of protective bit about you know the lying, you know that's really a big part of of, of the the issue around gambling is I suppose getting getting um, getting people to see the extent and the level you know of denial and lying that's it, that's there to protect their their addiction. I suppose there's a kind of a condition of cognitive bias or cognitive distortion in in gambling where there's a justification, you know, there's a justification for the behaviour. You know, there's always a justification. There's a justification for, well, for winning really is the skill of the gambler. You know, for losing, it's the external factor. It's the, it's, it's anything other than that. You know, it's, it's that kind of distortion, I think. That's part of the work and working with gamblers is to be part of the work that we'd have to do here is to get people to recognize those cognitive distortions and see them for what they are and work you know in a cbt way perhaps to to change that way of thinking and to see um to see how distorted it really is because there's that that level of denial i suppose is around all of that distortion and not really allowing yourself to see that you know level of distortion or even to see the harms that are associated with gambling, which are, I mean, there are huge harms, you know, there are general harms, there's critical harms, there's, you know, um, um, legacy harms, you know, there, there, there are different kind of harms in, in addiction, but very powerful. Alcohol is one, and I think that even is kind of, it's, it's um, you know, kind of, it's visceral in a way, because, I mean, you, you see the, the, the pub and the bookies are almost always next door. You know, there's that just connection there, just in, in the geographical sense, just that they're beside each other. And, you know, it's a pop from, you're in the pub to the bookies, in and out, in and out, in and out. So alcohol has its part to play in it. But I think, um, I think um, cocaine, I've noticed that cocaine is very much, a, 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 uh, seems to be much more a part of in, in people's strategies for dealing with their cocaine or with their, um, excuse me, gambling addiction. Because um, I suppose it's very difficult to cope with the feelings when you, you know, in, in, term, in, in gambling and, and that, adju that adjustment, you know, is made in, in, in needing the stimulant to escape, I suppose, because that's part of, part of the reason, I suppose, why people start. I think really there's a couple of different things about why people start. One is enhancement. You know, it's an, it, it you you add something. You you know, there's the prospect of financial gain. There's excitement. There's the fun aspect. Is one aspect of why people start. Um, there's um, there's um, social a social you know connection um, in in that world. There's been many studies done, you know, in, in relation to the reward, the reward pathways in the brain, 
and they operate very in a very similar way. Because even up until the 1980s, gambling wasn't really seen as an addiction. It was more seen as a maladaptive behaviour, you know. But it's a, it's an addiction. It's recognised as an addiction. And those stu brain studies they show that that the same processes happen, uh, and that there's, there's there's really a lot of um, there's a lot of emphasis on the the buzz, you know, in anticipation, you know, rather than the win itself. In actual fact, the buzz and anticipation can be more of a, a dopamine, you know, serotonin kind of, you know, release than um, than the actual win itself. So it's not it's not even about the win. It's a bit like the the, the addict, you know, and the habit in you know in, in preparing to use or or actually finding the substance. You know, all of the all of the the piece around that uh, that's as exciting as actually the use of the drug itself. So these are very real, you know, proven, you know, there's proven research about, about that. It's the process of the primary treatment. Now you have four weeks, you know, you, you might have six weeks. So that's a tall order when you think about it. But you know, really it's uh, the process of primary addiction is that seed, sowing the seed to make the change. And again, it's come back to that you know, that uh, trans-theoretical model of change, as I say, you know, to sow the seed to make the change. And it's the beginning of the process. So how do we do that? That's really by bringing awareness. I think that, like, awareness is a huge factor. In, and um, bringing that awareness to the individual, this is where this is at. You know, because there's, there's often blind spots about how serious the, the addiction is. But when you think about the harms, you know, the harms are huge. But so what's our, what's our process here? Our process here is in the program. And the program is to start with the blocks and assets that you begin with, with the consequences, with your life story, delivering your life story in a, an intensive atmosphere. And this is an intensive atmosphere from day one right to day 30. You know, it does not stop. It's, it's, you can't avoid the intensity of the program. So it's, we help in that way by, 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 by doing those processes, bringing step one into it, having peer evaluation, that all brings to bear to the patient, well, the reality of it. But that doesn't change the, you know, the, the thinking. So there's the other, the other ways of looking at it. And for a gambler, for me, that would be a lot to do with these cognitive bias that they hold and these cognitive distortions. And bringing those, bringing their awareness to these, challenging challenging these, because it's hard to challenge these in the gambler. Gamblers are very good, you know, they're really, 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 really intelligent people. Very, very smart people, because you've got to be intelligent to operate in the way that they do. And they will probably yes you to death sometimes, you know, they'll, they, they will agree with what you say, but not really mean it. So there's, there's, there's the piece about getting in underneath that and challenging that behaviour. CBT, you know, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, that's an approach to challenge the way they're thinking and to affect some kind of change in the, in the way that they're thinking about, about um, how they see their addiction. I mean, part of the programme here, a huge part, is the family aspect, the family conference that happens. Because that's when you really get a real picture, and you get a very real um, piece coming back from the family that this is the impact. And that's kind of, you can't escape that. It's a very important piece that the family, the family have an opportunity to convey um, in a safe environment um, the effect that the addiction has, has taken you know, in terms of relationship and fam, in, in, in the family. I mean, with children, it can be really, really tough and heartbreaking stuff sometimes. But it's important, I suppose, it's about bringing that reality back to somebody. Because it can be a little bit of um, not seeing the wood for the trees, kind of, you know, when you're in that space, not really, not really owning this behaviour. Um, it's the cunning and, you know, nature of addiction. It's like any group therapy, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very special environment, you know, group therapy, but it's also, it's an intense, can be an intensive 
environment. So obviously, you know, for somebody coming in who has no, has no experience of group therapy at Gambler, then it's quite a daunting prospect, you know, to um, really to bring forth what you need to bring in the group. You can't really hide, as I said, there's no corners in the in in the, in the group therapy you know you can't you can't hide and I think that's the that's the piece that's the powerful piece about the group because the group um, the group spot you know the def the defaults and or, or the defects rather um, and that's 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 un, unavoidable because in the process of the work you bring the pieces of work to group and the feedback comes from the, what you present so in a way, any minimising and minimising would be a you know a strong tactic, minimising harm and behaviour, um, that can't really be hidden, and that will be spotted because the best therapists in the in the place are in the group. And that's you know we're facilitating groups and we're guiding and you know we're challenging where we need to challenge and we're um, you know encouraging everyone to help everyone else to heal and recover. You know it's all about that. So. I don't think the, I think it's very helpful the group the powers in the group it's very powerful for an addict to come and to face into the reality because it's 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 unavoidable you can't you can't avoid it and it and that that comes through the group process There's such power in the group process with, with, with honesty honesty is probably the the big you know the honesty is is the biggest part because I mean they spent you know literally their lives, you know, in that, in that place in order to survive, you know, in, in that world of dishonesty. Yeah. And as, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, the lies that just come lie upon lie upon lie, such a difficult burden to hold, you know. They've been holding that burden for a long, long time. And so that's probably the, one of the hardest ones is to come to that place of honesty, to be able to um, evoke, you know, what's been held for a long, long time, and that can be difficult to do. That can be very, very hard for for um, a gambler to bring to the surface the truth about the behaviour, breaking down that, you know, breaking down the, the the block to being honest. So I would say honesty is probably one of the biggest. And again, you can't avoid that because you eventually. And particularly so in secondary treatment, I'd say, you know, because it's you've a long period of time to work on that. But when it when when you do get to that point where you, you know people can get really really honest about the behaviour, then I think you're really making great progress. But there's no guarantees in it either. You know, it's, it's it can be it can be difficult, and sometimes it can be so entrenched that it's it's almost impossible to break through. You know, but that's the endeavour. You know, and and the way that the work is structured here. It's designed to bring that about, you know, through your life story, through your step one, understanding that the powerlessness and unmanageability piece is real and admitting and accepting that that's what it's come to. So I think for that, group therapy has, has the power to do that. 